Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new and improved episode of Constructive Criticism. I'm your host, Spencer, joined by my co-hosts, Casey, the Mad Tune of Bloodworth. Hey, how's it going? Dude, this this week, my wife, who's sick, is like, hey, Spencer, do you, you make me a grilled cheese? And I was like, call Casey. Well, shout out to her for not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also joined by my co-host, Michael. <laughs> I also promised Casey not to call him to ask for a grilled cheese. Thank you. Why? It would be a long drive. It would probably be a cold grilled cheese by the time I got there. That's his That's his worry with this whole grilled cheese thing is, in fact, <laughs> that somebody will hand him a cold grilled cheese and he'll have to taste it yeah, or else be dubbed a jerk. That's among my concerns, yeah. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. Uh, this week, we're going to obviously talk about the Pro Tour. So that's exciting. Uh, the Pro Tour was sweet. Uh, before we get there, we want to talk about our sponsor at Oasis Games. You can check them out at OasisGamesSLC.com. You can get 15% off of your first order. I'm sorry. I have to tell you. Do not go to OasisGamesSLC.com. I did this last week. Please go to MDGOasis.com or OasisCCG.com. Um, there's a problem with the OasisSLC.com if you're on your phone. If you're on the regular, if you're like on your laptop it, or your computer, it will work. It'll just redirect you, but it doesn't work on the mobile web. So, uh, just a problem. That's why the podcast, if you... I actually have to announce this. This is so un, unreal. Anti-shout out to Crystal Commerce. If you're trying to listen to the podcast through the Oasis Games feed, you cannot. Because the website that Crystal runs for them to that for me to post articles and videos and things like that through does not exist. It I noticed that really as well. I went to look today and I just kept getting redirected to the same page that wasn't a page with any yeah. content it was interesting um, so i'm not sure why they aren't getting back to alex but i do apologize for anyone who has an inconvenience for that just go to constructedcriticism.com click oasis games in the top right corner and you can listen to the podcast there or i guess i don't know how what to tell the people who I, I like how i'm telling people if you can't listen to the podcast on oasis <laughs> games you can listen to it here but they're like <laughs> i can't listen well. to it that's awkward yeah, we're also going to be going door to door and trying to spread the word. So yeah, so you know, if you get the chance and you see somebody say, "Hey, constructive criticism on constructivecriticism.com dot com," otherwise they could be confused. It's a very intuitive <laughs> website name. <laughs> uh, also, don't forget that you can support the show directly by going to patreon dot com slash ccmtg. Every week you or every month you can support us with any amount that you see fit, starting at one dollar, and we appreciate everything we can get. Um, we're just outside of recording an extra podcast for you guys for that. We also talked about some benefits for the patron during our last podcast meeting. We're excited about the future of things like Google Hangouts and what we're going to do with them and uh, giving different things to the patrons of the show. And we appreciate you guys so much. So check it out at patreon.com slash ccmtg. Um, and there will, there will be exclusive content there eventually. But don't forget that this show will always be free for you guys because we appreciate you. Yeah. And that content may or may not include a green screen. So that's true. That could happen. We could really be moving up in the world here. A green yeah. screen. Imagine the possibilities. Exactly. You can do anything with a green screen. So there's that. Yeah, you can record Star Wars Episode One. I mean, you can at least it's do true. anything worth and, doing. And 300. <laughs> 300 was also done on a green screen? Yeah. I thought you were saying Star Wars Episode 300 for a second. I was like, no, can that's... we all live to see that, Casey? Can I dream? Well, let's see. They've made seven in about the last forty years, so no. But but, but I mean, you know, technology will will get. yeah. <laughs> I, technology might improve. They might make us live longer, or they might just start making a lot of really bad Star Wars or really great. Well, if they're making, I wouldn't bet on it. Six or seven a year. <laughs> Your standards may have to drop a little bit if they're making six or seven a year. Game of Thrones makes six or seven episodes a year. Or 10, right? Yeah, 10. Yeah, and those are great. That's true. There we go. Just turn Star Wars into Game of Thrones style. There we go. Now, we're done talking about Star Wars because <laughs> I could talk about it all day. Don't forget uh, that the point of this podcast is to hashtag always improve. What is hashtag always improving, Casey? It is just a way to track your progress, your own growth. And it's a way for us to talk about the th little things that we're doing to get better at magic every week. Because you never are done getting better. At magic or anything else. Exactly. There's <laughs> there's always something that you can be doing, right? Um, so, Casey, how did you get better at magic this week? Just 
cutting loose and having fun and, you know, trying to play charades with you while you're pointing at things. And I don't understand why. <laughs> I mean, that that would make me improve at life, too. <laughs> um, no, just, just having fun with magic, cutting loose and not feeling like under a ton of pressure to play. You know, I played in one ma- my first magic tournament in weeks and I played Kiki Control just because it's sweet. Because it is the sweetest. Yeah. If I didn't play Scapeshift, that's what I would play Modern. Yeah, it's it is sweet. I wish it were good. <laughs> <laughs> Ancestral Visions was great. That oh, card, man, that card, that, that gets that now. Yeah. Oh, I might have to switch it up. Oh my goodness, that card was so good. It almost made up for how bad Wall of Lemons is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to expect like in a normal meta game, you probably have a lot of wild Nicodles out there, and then that card looks great. I played against nothing but aggressive creature decks, and it was still the worst card in my deck by a lot. Oh, interesting. <laughs> But there's some creature decks that like good. Eldrazi said, and Affinity. What was it like to have fun playing Magic? It was it was fun actually. Yeah, thanks for asking. <laughs> it, was, it was it was <laughs> it was fun to have fun. Yeah, but did did you feel like having that moment where like you maybe played a format that you don't care about as much and like got to play an event made you love Magic a little bit more again? Yeah, exactly. It didn't feel like I was I had to be there. So it it made me actually want to play Magic. So even after like the tournament didn't go that great because I was playing Wall of Omens, I uh, I, I actually wanted I to sent, play Magic I when it was over. a theme to this week's podcast from Casey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be bitter out about it for a while. Um but I did, you know, actually want to go and play Magic after the event instead of just kind of like being relieved when I was done. That's a great feeling. And I think that even just the the you know that couple week break might have done that by itself. Yeah. But man, I'm I'm glad that you're having fun again. Me too. Uh, Michael, how did you improve at Magic? This oh, sorry, state champion, Michael Hinderocker. How did you improve at Magic this week? Oh wait, did you win states? I did. Uh... So are we? So I want to be clear. We have an agreement about that medal, right? Do I have to now wear it while we podcast? No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the other all, all the time. Okay. We have to wear it all, all right. the this time. Is, this is our official agreement. If you go O2 drop at a PPTQ, you must show up to the next PPTQ you play Anyone on wearing the, team. the state champion medal. Um, you should preferably wear sunglasses while you play as well. Oh, yeah. And uh, like slick back your hair. And so uh, for those who don't know, we had an agreement among a lot of us that we were all going to go to states. And that way, if one of us wins it, we can win the medal. Um, because the medals, that's a weird thing. Yeah. Like, it, it is weird. <laughs> like a trophy would be cool, a plaque. Uh, so, all these things I have to hide so my girlfriend has less opportunities to make fun of me for spending large amounts of my time playing Magic. Yeah. But like a medal? That, <laughs> like are you going to like – what percentage Next of medal – Next I go out to a nice dinner, I'm wearing that. <laughs> yeah. Say so what percentage of state championship medal recipients actually have worn their medal? Outside of the picture they force you to take? Yes. Zero. <laughs> Zero percent. That's, no, Mike. I've Mike seen Callahan Mike Callahan with has it. Done it. But it, it's, it's, I, I, nothing against SCG. Like, and some people probably really think it's cool, like, to have, I mean, yeah. I would want, and I, and I love, I love my plaque, right? Like, I have it hanging on every video you see on constructorcritism.com. There's yeah. a plaque behind us. It'd be nice if it were a cup, even a small one, just something you could drink out of, right? If it were a, to a toast. Did, if it, if didn't Tom Martell say that was mug, bad? I would be stoked. If it what? were a br- like a, a brass mug that said Utah State Standard Champion, well, I would be so even, stoked. Even a ceramic mug, right? World's best yeah. oh, state a magic set, player. A set, a set of, a set of uh, crystal that that all set state How about champion some on it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, practical items. That exactly. would be sweet. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, congratulations, first of all. Thank you. But that being said, how did you improve at magic this week? Uh, I played tight in matches that were important to me. I played well enough to take advantage of the good luck that I did have. Um, Mainly, I felt like I stopped making excuses for myself in events where I was already doing well. I I feel like in the past, I've been willing to overlook my own errors when they come late in events. You know, oh, well, I made it to the top four, so at least it was a pretty good day. But I, I notice as I play more and more, that stuff really sticks with me, and it really bothers me looking back knowing that Maybe I should have been able to win a match, but because I punted or just made a poor choice, I didn't get there. So it was it was really great for me this week to feel like I didn't let the deck down. Magic is a game where you rely enough on variance that even when you're playing well, your success isn't linear. You're not always going to do better than you did last time, and you have to really take advantage of every chance you have. 
You, you can't just say, oh, well, I top four this time. I'll win one eventually. I mean, you, there are a finite number of events. I mean, especially with PPTQs, there are a finite mm-hmm. number of events in every season. And if your attitude is just kind of loosey-goosey about winning, it, it it's hard. You don't get back there every time. Yeah. I mean, I agree. When, P, when pre-TQs were new, um, I don't know if you remember, Spencer, but like I was top eating him like crazy. Yeah. Like, and it was, you know, I was better than I am now back then. And pe- players in general were a little bit worse because there weren't as many competitive REL events. Yeah, players have gotten so much better from this. But uh, it's true. But I was just like top eighting him like crazy. And it just didn't like, I feel like I was just kind of like on autopilot the first half of the day. And then the top eight would start. And then that's when I had to start playing magic. But like, I didn't take it seriously enough because I was like, uh, I'll top eight the next one. And I'll top eight, you know, the two after that, whatever. I'll win one eventually. And it just never happened. But I top aided a bunch of them because I was just sort of satisfied with making it to the top eight for the most part. That like I was I was making more than my entry fee in prizes, so like I wasn't losing money playing in the events, and I was playing Magic, and I was having fun, and that was that. So, but like staying hungry, even when like you are having success, I think is a good lesson to learn. And it's hard to do. I mean, it's not easy to really. It's it's not always easy to really remain competitive when you are already doing pretty well. I mean, when you when you do make top eight of a PPTQ, there's nothing wrong with being happy that you made top eight. I mean, that is for a lot of us kind of an it's, arbitrary. It's, a, it's kind of an ar- arbitrary achievement, right? But but it's a good marker that you've played good magic that day and you've given yourself a chance now to actually win the event. I think the trick is just there's a difference between being happy that you've made it that far and being satisfied with making it that far. I every time I make top eight, I'm very pleased with myself. I you know it it makes me smile, but you know then. I take 30 seconds and we sit down and start playing and I just want to win again. You know, the PBDQ two weeks ago, um, that was not really my attitude going into it. Um, I didn't, I didn't care about making the top eight. I wasn't happy that I top eighted. Um, I mean, we, we talked this a little bit internally, but like this podcast is going to take a weird turn. Um, (laughs) uh, but the, I'd rather O2 drop than, than lose in the finals of a PPTQ because I value my time so much. Um, now, at the same time, I'd, I'd rather win every match of Magic that I can. Um, so it's it's a it's a balancing act. Um, it, it's, it's hard to think about for me. We'll, we'll kind of move on a little bit. Um, my always improving moment kind of changed today than what I wrote down because I, I write the shows on Thursdays and I include some of my stuff in there at that time. But today is actually the one-year anniversary of me qualifying for the Pro Tour for the first time. And uh, I don't know. I feel like I wasted a year of magic just not caring enough, being content with going to the Pro Tour, day twoing my first Pro Tour, three owing my first Pro Tour draft, and feeling content that I knew that I could do those things. So what's my next step? Like, what do I care about? And... I, don't, I still don't know. Um, I still want to go back and crush PV, like I said last week. <laughs> but I don't know. I'm I'm making a lot of stupid mistakes lately in Magic, and I don't know how to fix them without... I mean, like, a year ago I was playing really good Magic. I was playing tight. I wasn't making as many misplays. And now... I still play a lot of magic and still make them. So I'm not sure that I have an always improving moment other than realizing that I have let myself get this way. And so that's something that I need to fix if I want to be good at magic again. I've kind of felt at times that, at least for me, I went through a stage where I didn't think I was good at magic. Yesterday. Well... (laughs) <laughs> and now okay. you have a medal to remind well, you now i have a medal so anytime i'm feeling down i'll just hang it over my head and go sit in the shower um, <laughs> what? But if, if i'm if i'm feeling like i need to cry i'll put on the medal first to remind myself that oh, at least once i won something okay no, but I mean, I think I went through a period where I didn't think I was very good, and then being invited to play and test with you guys made me press for a while, feeling like I had to sort of prove to myself and to people who maybe believed in me more than I did that I was at least reasonably good at playing Magic. 
And I think just kind of letting go of that where you're sort Wait of a trying second. too hard. You're saying the reason you keep beating me is because I invited you to test with me? I mean, obviously. All right, you can get off the team. <laughs> My bane right now. <laughs> But, but I think you have to find the balance between not caring and trying too hard. Because when you try too hard and you care too much about your finishes, as opposed to just playing the best you can and enjoying yourself, I, I don't think that's healthy either. I don't know. I, I think that um, – I don't think that I left that PPTQ like angry. I think it was like this – I think it was the second place finish that like didn't bother me as much. And that's what I mean by – I had this want to win really good, like this want that I hadn't had in a while and like was really excited to play Magic again, but I didn't care. Well, first of all, I couldn't go to the RPTQ, right? Sure. And my favorite part about Magic is travel, so that was a huge problem. But at the same time, like, what have I done the last year? So like two weeks after I qualified for the Pro Tour, I won a PPTQ. And then I went to an RPTQ after not playing an entire season. I then skipped the next season. So I skipped two seasons after qualifying for a pro, a pro tour. And it's just weird. It's weird that this is like, I literally played in what like six events. And then, so I played in 11, 11 competitive REL events outside of a pro tour and an RPTQ in one year. That's so weird for me. Like, when I look back on it, it doesn't even make sense. And I don't know why. I don't know why I decided to, do like, squander... How many how many competitive REL events did you and Austin combine play in last season? Far too many, given our general lack of success. But, like, <laughs> for real, was it, was it 24? At w least. Like... God, it might have been 24 for me alone. No, it wasn't that many. It felt like it. it felt like about a hundred thousand. <laughs> I, I was going through a real cold streak for a while, and Magic kind of sucks when you can't stop it, losing. It does. But what it my really point does. is, is like, what's your goal, right? So I, so I, I, I don't want to be aimless anymore. I think part of this is like I had this a little bit. I think some of this was being sort of hung over from the RPTQ that I played in because I had this sort of experience too, where I won a PPTQ uh, at the end of November and. Not that long after that, you guys asked me if I wanted to test with you, and I felt like things were like really moving forward for me, like I was improving quickly, and kind of everything was like working out and coming together. And then going to an RPTQ and doing, I didn't do horribly, but I didn't do well, um, and just generally being unhappy with uh, like my choices in deck selection leading up to it, and including the RPTQ, it it was just hard for me to like get back into things again, and I I can't help but wonder if coming off a pro tour and basically realizing that you've played in a pro tour, but at the end of it, you're basically in the same spot you were before you'd ever, ever qualified, except that you've now done it once, but just realizing, okay, now I need to do that again. It's just, well, daunting. I didn't have that. I didn't have that feeling, but, but I, I think that's why, like, like saying, okay, that was really hard to qualify before. And now I'm back at square There's one. Three years of my life gone. Right. Now I'm back at square <laughs> one. Right. I mean, I qualified for a pro tour and it was great and you did well. But, you know, I mean, unless you go, what, 11 and 5 and are invited back for the next one, you're right back on that grind again. And it's, it's hard true. to just, I, like, I think get that, off the Pro Tour no, and go to a PPTQ. Well, and also, and you kind of met your heroes, right? Like, you've spent, like, years of your life trying to get to this point of playing on the Pro Tour. Like, you went to sleep thinking about the Pro Tour, woke up thinking about the Pro Tour some, a lot of days. And you got there. And then it was like, well. It was the exact same as day two of a GP. Yeah, it was like, now what? Well, yeah. right, you just, you get there and it's basically like, okay, well, unless you win or, you know, really, yeah. really make such a big splash that this is like now can be a lifestyle for you, you basically realize nothing changes. Now I'm back to trying to qualify again. You guys are making me depressed. No, and hopefully I can do better that time. And I mean, but that's just the way things are. Like, if... So how do I, how do I, man, we, this is going to be a journey because I have to figure out how to get over it. I have to, because I love magic. I love, this is, this is probably the part of magic I love the most now. Um, I love making content, but you can't make like, like the people listening, like I'm eternally grateful. Oh, I mean, I've met some of the greatest people I know through this game and through doing stuff like this. But if I want the success that some of my heroes have, the people that I talk to on a regular basis, like KYT and Marshall, you know, how, how do I make that happen? And, you know, Quentin believed when he was on the show, that it was through us qualifying for Pro Tours. 
um, and and winning at events. And I don't think that's. I don't know. I I think there are multiple paths. I think the most clear path, the path that involves the least amount of kind of bizarre events and good luck, oddly, is uh, participating in and winning at Pro Tours. Because that's what if, if people if people see you winning. You figured something out that not everyone has, well, and, and it, yeah, it gives I mean, credibility, right? That's yeah, yeah. Especially, well, exactly. I mean, if, if I want to listen to what you have to say, it makes sense that I would. If you well, why did you listen to what I had to say before you joined the show? Because you're a better player than I am. I don't think that's true. Well, that's flattering. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, like, there's as far as us as a show. I appreciate that, Michael. I'm sorry. For, I, I, I'm no, sorry I if I that, downplayed I mean that. 100. No, I. I really think that it's very easy to listen to people you think are better than you, or at least like around the same level as you and have interesting ideas. But, yeah. You know, if you know someone is like dramatically worse than you, it's hard to take what they have to say seriously. Right? Sure. I mean, just like if you're a five star chef or whatever, you're not going to like go take advice from a fry cook. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could, but we've delved really deep into this and probably got more personal than we've gotten on this podcast in a long time. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of segments on this show, so I let this go a little bit longer. But I hope that I can figure out a path for me in Magic. Um, because for the little while, I wanted it to be to help others qualify for RPTQs and go to the Pro Tour. And um, with things that are happening in my personal life, I'm thinking... I, I literally feel like I wasted a year as I'm facing things that might make it so that I might not be able to play as much Magic. And it's like, dude, I, I played in 11 events last year. It's less than one a month, and now you're like, I'm never going to be able to play one again. <laughs> like, yeah. So it's, you, you just have to let that fuel you when you do have the chance to play. Just it, understand that's that what every I'm saying, event is, I, is important. I, 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 I took for granted can. the leeway I was given when my wife said, I, like, I don't know. I don't know what I was doing. But I hope that I can find a path and that I can always improve even more than I was. I hope that I hope that uh in three years I'll be draft master of the pro of the Pro Tour and go to Worlds. Like that would be really cool. Yeah. I wouldn't well, take that too for what it's worth. Yeah. I'm assuming Casey wouldn't yeah. wouldn't object either. No, I would <laughs> happily take it. Um but no, like what's what's my next goal? Um it, I mean, there's things going on in the Pro Tour scene that we won't talk about this as a podcast, but what's my next goal? Like what do I want to do? And I hope that I can find that. Don't forget that uh, every week on the show that you can participate as a patron of the show. Um, I did not post to the patreon.com slash CCMTG this week um, because of we have so much to talk about. But, you know, in the future, every week I'll post something. You can post on it. You're always improving moment and we'd be happy to talk about it and share it with share with the listeners. Like we care what you guys are doing, too. So. All right. No powerings this week. Instead, I'm just going to give you guys some data and then we're going to talk about it for just a minute. Okay. So the decks that had six plus wins at the PT, and these are the number of these decks. So there were three Esper Dragons decks that had six plus wins, four black green control, six Jund midrange, seven black green aristocrats, eight green white tokens, 16 green red ramp, 18 humans decks, and 18 bant company decks. The straight skipped over Esper control. Yeah, I don't care about that. Uh, at five, I have five. Shout out to us. Austin. <laughs> yeah, sure. Shout out to Austin. Um, that's actually pretty impressive because that's really like eight Esper decks, right? Yeah, you combine the two. Although, yeah, it, when, you it, no, the, it is. when you look at the players playing those decks, sure, yeah. like like to the yeah, best well, ones in the like, world. But like, yeah, was was anyone Shota sent Manfield? Can I just say, was anyone surprised that that Shota top aided with Esper Dragons? No, I mean, and, and PV said that he wished he had played the green white tokens deck, but he also said he was only like four cards off from Shota's list. Well, I think the difference is that the other the deck that PV audibled off was like the deck with the best win percentage for the entire Pro Tour. So it sort of makes sense to me that he would regret not playing the team deck when the team deck was the deck. But, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that he thinks Esper was a bad choice. Just that Shota doing well with a deck is... It's, it's sort of like PV doing well with a deck. We it doesn't be, say that much about the deck. Can we be clear here? <laughs> There's nine decks that had... So I didn't include any... There was multiple decks with two. There was a lot of them. Yeah, sure. So I cut it off at three. Um, and I could have cut it off at four and just included all Esper decks at eight. Um, but I thought that Black Green Control with the top eight like should be talked about and Esper Dragons with the top eight should be talked about. Um, that that Goggles deck seemed... I don't actually know that it was that good. So I didn't really include it in this. But 
man, that's a lot of decks. This this was this was the best Pro Tour I've watched in a very long time. Yeah. By, a, by a huge margin. Yeah, I mean, it's super interesting in terms of just all of the different ways you could... And they're, they're not, like, slightly different decks. This feels like Innistrad, dude. No, they, they are wildly different. There are a lot of them. There's something for everyone. And getting to watch the feature matches, too. There were Man, two- I was getting so spoiled. It's like every round you're watching, like, Finkel, LSV, Shota. You're just... You're watching, like... Brad, I mean, Brad Nelson. Some of the greatest players in the world playing... Brad, Almost anything you could Brad possibly Nelson imagine. Brad Nelson might have locked up Hall of Fame. I mean, he was so, certainly uh, crushing with that deck. So and that deck third was sweet. Top eight? Third top eight and a world's top eight. Yeah. And a, and a player of the year. Like, there. I mean... It's pretty well, close. And yeah, more importantly, close. it seemed like he figured out a team that works for him, right? I he mean, could do it next week. I was going to say, right? It, yeah. it's, like, the, the, this Pro Tour, there was two flavors of company, three flavors of humans, two flavors of ramp. Well, more than two, but the other one was like mono green. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, there was you know multiple flavors of John midrange, multiple flavors of Vesper control with Esper dragons in it. Like th- th- this format is amazing. And if you jump down to decks that had less copies, so maybe were less sort of uh, broadly archetypical, but still had someone think they were good enough to play, there are a lot of decks that did yeah. reasonably well. Uh, who made deep runs with all I, kinds I of stuff. I saw a few things, a uh, few like Sultai variants, just all kinds of stuff. I mean, it yeah. really seems like if you go through that list of decks and you can't find one you like, I I don't know what then to tell you. you don't love magic. It's, it's a you problem, not a you, deck yes, problem. There, there this, are so many things you can this, play. This, uh, it, was, it, was before, it was right before States. Um, so it was before, it was day one of the Pro Tour right after it. Um, actually, it was when during, did I when did I call you? It might have been before that. Uh, it was Friday yeah, evening, sometime. Maybe maybe day one was over. Maybe it was no. I, I guess it was over because it was evening. Yeah, and it was. Yeah, and I was, said, I said, Casey, this is going to go down down as the best standard format ever, and it yeah. went down as my favorite Pro Tour ever. Yeah, it was sweet. That conversation as a whole was really funny, but I can't repeat everything you said on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I am in love. Let's get right into this for this Pro Tour special episode. Um, what was the card that most impressed you from Shadows of Vanderstraat? For me, um, it, it might not have been from the Pro Tour. It actually might have been against, in my match against Michael. Uh, it states, but... By the way, Michael beat me again. So there are people keeping tally. Michael now has more <laughs> wins over me than the rest of my co-hosts literally combined every single one of them, except... Kyle Fubo might have beat me a couple times. I don't know. But he's got like five wins over me or something. So uh, I've beaten you a few times. We've played a bunch at like at regular RL, but we've only played, I think, one time at competitive RL. Well, the secret is play more collected company. The decks. secret is actually just play more matches against me, I think. Yeah. I think I've only played Quentin a few times too, but he now, I believe, has everyone beaten together. <laughs> and it's just not even fun anymore. Um, <laughs> but but I in, in that match, um, I'm pretty sure if you had ne- not, I th- actually think if you had never drawn a Cryptolith right, it would have never beaten me. Not not one game? Uh, probably not. That card is sort of weird. It, it's like very, it's, it's, it, it's, it's very bipolar, right? When it's great, it feels like really unfair. It's like Earthcraft almost. <laughs> and when it's not great, it's I don't, actually I don't, just does nothing. I don't know, because it was great against me both times. But the, the thing that I noticed is there are cards that are good when you're ahead, right? This card is not good when you're ahead. This card is, I'm now winning this game. You actually don't have a chance. Sure, yeah. Um, kind of like the way Nykthos felt. Yeah, where it really just puts it over the top. It's like, okay, you were ahead. This is now unfair. Um, that's that's kind of how that card felt. Uh, I haven't had that feeling since, you know, for a year with a card. I was super impressed with that. Um, Michael, you have Westvale Abbey down. This is the card that Cryptolith Wright made me think was broken. But that made me think Cryptolith Wright was broken. So I was really impressed watching pros play with Westvale Abbey because Westvale Abbey isn't a card that's had a lot of success in his standard format to this point, like at SCG Opens. But watching pros play with it and people who just like actually understand how to play good magic really inspired me to play a Westvale Abbey deck this weekend because if if you're playing it in decks that are built to take advantage of it and can sort of use it to uh, almost 
to, to put pressure on an opponent from multiple different angles, it's just brutal to play against. The deck building cost to playing it is almost zero, as it showed up in both green white tokens and in the green black uh, aristocrats deck. And other decks. But uh, those two I felt used it most effectively, where they could just put the opponent in positions where almost no matter what they did, they were either going to get killed by a bunch of little things or by a 9 7. And it was just sort of, you can choose how you want to die, but you're dying. Yeah. And it's a land. Yeah, you're going out, but yeah, it it is interesting. It it did give the deck sort of a, well, you messed up, you tapped out. Like, almost like you were playing a combo deck. Yeah. Casey, Casey, what about you? What card impressed you most? Um, I'd have to say Seasons Past. Just because, Holy crap. Just because that card looked unplayable. I, well, okay, if we're talking about cards that went from bad to, oh, okay, this is actually dumb. <laughs> that card went from, like, zero to... Is this like one of the four or five best cards in standard? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, it went from I wouldn't play you guys that realize in most they were draft only decks. Two? Well, in four dark petition. Uh, so Right, but like Combo what? deck. Combo deck, yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh Quentin and I bought Quentin bought that deck on Moto. I bought uh, we both bought decks on Moto so that we have because we share cards. We now have the uh, both of our two favorite decks are built on Moto. I'm so excited to play Moto now. I'm going to play Moto right now. You guys um, want to finish this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go play Green Black Control. Yeah, but that card is uh, powerful. It doesn't... If you read the card, it, it's like... This is like a six mana sorcery. Six mana die. Six mana lose the game. Why would you ever cast that? But then somehow Please, wouldn't do you... Do you want to play a green deck? Uh, I mean, I don't know that I love... I would actually play this deck, but I think it's sweet. Okay. So eventually... Yeah, I mean, it, I'm sure it, I'll play it, it it's once. Not, it's not priority one, but it's yeah. going to happen. I think it's the next deck that I'm going to play. I don't even care if it's good next week. Like, <laughs> like what? Six mana draw seven spells is strong. That's the thing. That's the thing <laughs> that impressed me the most. It was not <laughs> six mana draw four. It was uh, draw draw four cards that you've already wanted to cast throughout this game. Or five. Or six. What? What? Why? Yeah, I mean, and then, and then somehow, if by yeah. like late game, it's like demonic tutor six times and that feels powerful it, <laughs> like, it just doesn't seem like a thing a magic card should do it like was so cool like and the whole demonic uh sorry not demonic pact i'm mixing up pro tour decks here um the dark whole petition. dark petition thing just i it seemed sort of obvious once you'd seen it happen but the first time I saw that happen and figured out what was going on, I was just sitting there with my jaw on the floor like, yeah. oh my god, why why is this something you're allowed to do? It, it's like, If someone's trying to grind you out of it, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because Seasons Past had that put it on the bottom of your deck thing, which obviously means that it was too good in testing without that, right? You don't just like start with that kind of line of text on a card. Sure. So it should have been obvious that there was something to that card, but it was not obvious. And then, like, Dark Petition, yeah, was really the key that unlocked that whole thing, which well, isn't, like... The fact that it probably made it better, because yeah. it not only means that you can get Seasons Past out of your deck, it means you have to run less Seasons Past, because you can go grab it when you need it. Right. You yeah. don't You don't have to, you get to. Sure. Yeah, and it occupies a f the five slot, which, like, you don't have a ton of fives you'd want to be playing, so, like, it's right. nice with Seasons right. Past. Yeah, it was just, like, synergies on synergies. No, that, that deck was so cool. That, that was a deck where, like, watching that, if that didn't, I don't know, make you feel a little tingly, <laughs> we're playing, we like different styles of magic, I guess, but that deck is sweet. <laughs> it was very political. <sighs> Welcome to epi your third episode. I, I, yeah, I don't know, I don't want to be, I don't want to say anything too bad, like, I mean, maybe you just don't like good magic cards, I don't know. You don't like drawing <laughs> seven spells for six mana. I do. I want to do it. Um. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Like, what a... What a sweet card. Um, did this PT surprise you? Was something from the SEG results that you expect to see play at the PT? My answer is just no. Um, we had a little bit of differing opinions on our testing team. I thought that this PT would completely change the format. And Austin thought that there would be very small, minute changes to the format. Um, I literally said, I expect... Pan I, I told Quentin, I told multiple people, I said, Pantheon is going to bring a two-color control deck to this Pro Tour, and it's going to change the format. It's going to do well. Um, I, and then from just my initial testing, I knew that Bant Company was beatable. I knew that you could beat humans and Bant Company if you wanted to. And if I can do it, the best players in the world can do it. So I knew that the format was going to be sweet. Like, 
I didn't know it was going to be this sweet, but I knew that it would not be... I knew that if you wanted to be both, you could. And that was half the battle. It, it's probably more than that. I mean, it was... <laughs> Way more than was, was the, the whole battle. It was all of your results. It was like nineteen out of thirty-two was just banned company, right? right? I mean, it was like two thirds of the battle for one of those decks, right? So, you know, I, I I was not surprised. I there was no surprises here, and I'm really proud of Pantheon for proving me right. And I that deck is so cool. It is cool. I like. I'm not 100 percent convinced that it's like good all the time. Because like sometimes decks that John Dude, Finkel played seventy percent of the time it works all the time. Yeah, maybe, but is it, it was a deck sweet. I want to be good? Yeah. Yes, it it's majestic. That's what it is. <laughs> they found a unicorn, dude. <laughs> yeah, apparently they I, were I was, building. I was, I was watching coverage. Well, I was yeah. watching coverage and LSV was saying that Matt Nass found the same shell but couldn't build a version of it that was actually good. But found the Dark Petition uh, seasons past combo and they tried a bunch of shells with that and didn't think it was good so we're really surprised when someone else showed up with the same deck and it was sweet yeah you hear about that a lot where they're like oh i can't believe that we were missing this little thing sure. yeah. yeah i i mean it, it's crazy i think that when you get a bunch of good players together of you know of, of of good skill level right i mean you and matt found blue white blue white humans michael and i you know i quentin myself and gage back you know, in 2012, found Jun mid range. I was gonna say, let's let's not equate blue white humans to seasons past. Uh... No, I'm I'm just saying like <laughs> that deck is a lot sweeter than anything I've ever come up with in my entire life. What? Uh, I'm just I'm what I'm saying is like, you know, but like th- when you get a bunch of people in a room together, when you have, I mean, a lot of these people function the same way we do. I've I mean, it's it's getting in a Facebook group with nine of your friends and like this is what I found this is what I found what do you think of this what do you think of this and it works the hive is so much stronger and you're not surprised you're not surprised to hear things like oh we had the colorless Eldrazi deck but we didn't have Chalice of the Wade yeah or we had Mono Blue but we didn't have Frostburn Weird so we were short of two drop right it's, like just random stuff like it's, that it's so easy th- like to, be, I mean, we had mono blue, we had mono blue devotion for that pro tour for Alex, and it just and like, he didn't play it because I told him he could not play judges familiar or not judges familiar. Cloud Fin Raptor. I told him he could not play Cloud Fin Raptor, and I stand by that decision. <laughs> but you know, I I think that when you see stuff like that, like when you see these pros that are so close to each other, I um, mean, you guys, you both of you on this section, you guys put deck diversity. You guys were surprised by the number of decks. Yeah, I mean, it's almost never eight in the top eight, right? Like, I don't know that I've, like, ever seen a tournament where that happened. I, the thing I is, was... is all, I think that seven of those eight decks were actually great. Well, I was I was impressed by... Which one's not? Oh, the right, red-white? I don't I don't think that you can justify playing red-white over green-red. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think you can. I think that one of them's better than the other. But I think that, th- like, the other seven decks, I actually believe are all good. I even think Esper Dragons is great. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, it's not like it suddenly got worse, right? Like it's all the exact same cards that it always was. I mean, yeah. except dig through time. But but so what about that? Eh, eh, dig through time. You can I, play Dragon Lord's prerogative. I, it's like I don't, the same thing. I was gonna say I don't know that the replacement value of dig through time is as high in standard as it might have been in Legacy or Modern. But, no, that's true. But that's I, true. I think that you. Guys, I think that Casey's right. I think that there's so much diversity, and I you had the same feeling. Man, is that just not the greatest? I no, I was. It, it wasn't just that people were able to find a deck that beat Bant Company and humans. It was more that people were able to find all kinds of decks that had interesting matchups with each other. And some of them, you know, it wasn't like Bant Company and humans didn't do well. They still put up reasonable results because they're good decks. I was just impressed by the fact that you know, all of a sudden, I went from having like two or three decks I felt like I could play to like fifteen. You know, no. it's like I they're like fifteen decks that I would be super happy to sleeve up tomorrow and that's not a place i think i've ever been in this game. is the feeling i got when i could play five color control far seek ranger's path stored nothingness sweetness like this this that deck was so is, bad that deck went i went undefeated with that deck in a utah invitational that deck was sweet i don't know what to tell you i i played it people loved playing that deck and it was just a disaster i only played it at one event and i was the 
one of the greatest things that have ever happened to me. So it's a good time <laughs> to hang it up after oh. one event. I mean, it was Probably. unplayable after that event. It was unplayable before that event, but no. people just had no idea what you were doing. Dude. So it, they were just dead. You know, everyone was playing like these mid-range decks, and you were like, Ranger's Path, and they were like, oh, I'm dead. Yeah, we've all been far-seeked into Ranger's Path, into what just happened to me. <laughs> is, it, is it bad that I literally don't know what Ranger's Path is? It's, it's double far forests. <laughs> oh, okay. So you grabbed, and this deck played Gristlebrand, Thragtusk, Hutmaster <laughs> of the Thales, Rakdos' Return, and Sphinx's Revelation. And Door to Nothingness. And it was the sweetest thing I've ever played. That sounds awesome. Were you, were you playing Worldfire? No, that was Alex. He won the event with the World Thragfire deck. <laughs> <laughs> he played it to beat us, because there were five of us playing it at this event. You played it, didn't you? I don't think so. I think you did. I have never you, played that me, deck. Quentin, Gage all played it. I played Flash at that event. Okay. Well, you you done goofed. <laughs> Apparently. Um, no, I, I think that like that's how sweet this format is. Is like Somebody's going to find sweet things like this. I'm excited. I'm excited for the future. Um, is there a deck that you expected the pre- uh, is there a deck or a card that you expected at the PT that you did not see? I expected more Arlen Court. I mean, there were some, but I expected more. Um... It was worse in my testing than I thought it would be, but it was better than people said it was. Uh, some people were playing it. It was it was fine, but I, I would expect more of it in the future. Uh, Casey, Reality Smasher. Yeah, just Eldrazi decks at large. People, like, I, I expected Mono Red or Eldrazi or specifically Mono Red Eldrazi to kind of be around as, like, an aggro deck that really is asking the hard questions. And it just wasn't really around, and it may be just the mid range year decks or just have too much going on. I'm not sure. Michael, you have do you have a thought on that before I move on? Um, so I, I was talking about this a little bit earlier, uh, just with Spencer and Casey, and I I thought that maybe like especially with Red Eldrazi, I think some of the success, at least that I experienced personally playing around with it, was I was really surprised at how good Four Chandra was. Um and as people have sort of accepted Chandra as a card you can easily play three or four of, I think maybe the Eldrazi deck loses some of its appeal because it's sort of a weird deck to play four Chandra in, honestly, except that in Mono Red there just aren't any other cards to play, so you yeah. sort of get stuck with it. Um, but finding that you can just, like, you can just feel good about playing three or four Chandra in a Th- deck, that's... I think, opens up a lot of yeah. new possibilities. I, I think that the I think that's why, when I said that I thought seven of the eight decks were great in the top eight, I think that, like... You're just you're just worse off playing this style of deck over something like green red, and I mean that's not that's not terrible. Like the the goggles deck that Luis played was super sweet, um, but, but I think that this really ends up basically being mono red plus two Eldrazi displacers at least in the main deck, right? Right, uh, uh, and you can play a full other color for basically no cost. So unless you think Eldrazi displacers, I mean it's is not really than... that right because like it's red plus colorless. Well, right, but you can play red green plus colorless, no problem. Yeah, I mean, there's. I think you could easily build a deck that could play all the goggles stuff, some of the green ramp stuff, and thought not seer if you wanted it. You can. I've done it. But <laughs> the thing is, is like that's that's my point. Is what's the point in doing this over something else? Sure. And I think that some of that is just that when you haven't seen deck lists already, but you're sort of constructing from scratch, and your testing gets a little bit inbred. You know, like if you just had yeah, access definitely. to all the Pro Tour decks but you didn't know how they were going to finish, maybe people would play different things for the Pro Tour, but given that you have to come up with everything, right. not everyone is going to settle on the same version of similar decks. Sure. Uh, Michael, uh, you have a very surprising one, because uh, I, I don't understand. Last week you said that you didn't think Black White was good, and then this week you're surprised that there's not black, more Black White at the Pro Tour. Well, I don't think it's very good. I was surprised that it basically saw zero play. Not only that it didn't have success, but that, like, almost no one in general played it. Um, It just surprised me a little, given that, like, two weeks ago, you know, we were seeing White Black Eldrazi as the choice of a bunch of guys who I consider to be very good Magic players. You know, all those Star City guys played White Black Eldrazi and mostly did pretty well with it. So it just just surprised me to see a deck uh, fall from grace so quickly. That's not surprised at all. I mean, I get what you're saying. I do think that the deck... I think that the, the, the white-black mid-range deck looked reasonable. The white-black Eldrazi deck looked kind of sure, bad. but I, I mean, I'm saying this as any white-black deck. I mean, I don't think really yeah. anyone played white-black of any variety at the Pro Tour, essentially. So 
I mean, maybe just in doing more Dude, advanced when, testing when, and doing more... Uh, when Seth Manfield was winning with Soren and he had three other Planeswalkers in play, I was terrified of getting... Did you see Soren win that game? Like, <laughs> did you see the other three Planeswalkers he had to play first? It did kill one of Luis Salvador's Chandra's. I mean... Why are, Sean... you, why are you contributing? <laughs> it seemed good. This is the hill I've chosen to die on. It's 100%. I, I don't I, really... I don't know if it would if Lindala would have been better or worse in any of those situations. I, I have no idea. Nor do I might have been the exact same I, outcome. I don't know. I can't get behind playing Sphinx of the Final Word, so I think I'd play Lindala just so that I never had to play Sphinx. <laughs> that That's... just that just seems man, I don't know. I watched the I, I can't match believe you're surprised by this. I actually think that the deck is bad. I it, think that it, it may well be. It just it, it's just it surprised me to see people just drop something that had been at least reasonably successful Here, so quickly. No, here's the thing is I think that it I think that decks like that draw good players to it. And that's great. I think that like but I think that a lot of the win percentages of things like this and like black red dragons come from the fact that a lot of those players are just better than their opponents. And yeah, that's it's very true. I mean, Tom Ross was one of the people who like really drove the success of Black Red Dragons, right? Because he and was winning. He's a with monster, it. right? And when he's on, he's on. Like he, he is a to be tough out. Successful with whatever he plays, basically. Yeah. It just. I mean, there are some guys where it's kind of like Finkel. I you don't put too much stock in what he's playing because you could probably give him like, I don't know, a cardboard An box deck. and a chewed piece of gum, and he'd <laughs> somehow be in the Pro Tour top eight, and we'd be really confused about it. But there he'd be. Uh, did you know that PV hates that joke? What joke? The ham sandwich joke. The ham. He hates it. Well, I mean, I mean it's stupid, but <laughs> it, it just. It, all I'm saying is, compared to, I, I think if you give John Finkel a deck that he he is so much better than the average player, even at the pro tour level, that he he's one of he's, he's one, of, he's one of the few people in the world I who beat can him. like outskill opponents in pro tour matches it's, my, it's disconcerting <laughs> honestly watching it it's disconcerting my, my next goal in magic is to beat john minkle so Please. i have to go to any gp where storm is legal all right catch him <laughs> right, you, you might have to just catch him coming out of work and just kick him in the shin a couple of times that's by far the easiest way to beat up john finkel uh no we had a great he talk. wants to be him not beat him. no beat him i, want oh, to I thought you him. said be him no i want oh, to okay. beat him nice um I want to beat John Finkel. Uh, John Finkel well, is yeah, it one of the nicest guys I've ever met. I'm going to beat him real good at cribbage. <laughs> it's going <laughs> yeah, down. What? He's at like a... swimming, Casey. I want to beat him at swimming. <laughs> He's pretty lean. I don't know. I would. Uh, I feel like there's 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 arenas you could beat him in. <laughs> I think you just have to refocus the your more. efforts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I bet he's not very good at that. Seems kind of neurotic. Like I don't know that he's played a lot of thumb wars. I mean, in a hair on my head contest, I like my chances. <laughs> That's true. That was rude. I'm trying to think of ways I it can was beat a John low Finkel, blow. and not much is coming to mind. That's um, about it. No, I want to beat John <laughs> Finkel. At Magic. You give me a run for my money. Okay, all right. I want to beat John Finkel at Magic. Uh, I don't think that's. I don't think that's an unreasonable goal to set for yourself as a lifetime goal. No, it's just about uh, playing it, the tournaments that he plays in, right? Right. And I have to play every tours. tournament. Yeah. No, it's every tournament where Storm is legal and Pro Tours. I think that GP Portland was the last GP he played in. No, is that well? That was the last tournament that Storm was legal. To be fair, no, he <laughs> played GP Oakland uh, in January. I yeah, saw him on any coverage. any limited GP that he's allowed to play in, he'll. No, play he in. played a standard GP in January. There you go. Interesting. I just gotta message him. Hey, what what GPs you got? How much at? do I have to pay you for you to concede to me? What? No, that's not happening. In my in my private event, it doesn't even have to be a real match. No, I'm event. I'm gonna crush him. <laughs> He just That's, come sit at the card store with me. I'll pay him fifty so bucks. So what? <laughs> when <laughs> when you watch the pro tour, what is something you're trying to learn or see? Casey and you guys are just copying each other. Casey and Michael, you guys just. I put for you, Michael. I put what would Finkel do? And Casey, you said watch the greats and learn from how they see it. Yeah. So it's the same thing. Exactly. Just learning. Trying to get into their heads, say, okay, in this situation, I would make this play, and then I see either if they make the same play, or if they go a different way, and then I reevaluate, okay, is this significantly better, or is it just a different way of thinking? Is it is their way of thinking significantly better? Is it going to pay more dividends? I wonder if Turnwald wasn't on screen enough for you this pro tour, I bet. Yeah, that guy, or you, yeah. Both of them are just like, what just happened? How did you do that? Why did you do that? Why Why have I never done that? <laughs> exactly. I, I, I agree. I, I like watching players who I know are better than me uh, just make decisions and, like, see how they value cards and how they time things. And 
I think you can learn a lot from. I mean, almost anyone can learn a lot from that. Uh, just not. You have not to be in the mindset to do it, though. That's one of the things that I want to say about this is, like, uh, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away on this podcast, we, I talked about how if you're watching the Pro Tour to correct players, you're not watching the Pro Tour to learn. But if you're watching the Pro Tour to question the players, you are watching the Pro Tour to learn. And, I mean, that's not to say that the whole time I'm watching the Pro Tour, I'm sitting there with, like, a notepad studying either. It is just super entertaining to watch really good players play really sweet decks against each other. It's not like every second you're watching Magic has to feel like you're striving to become a better Magic player. It is okay to just take it in and enjoy it. Um, But... It's interesting when you get into sort of tenuous spots in a game to watch a player who you know, I mean, obviously understands their own deck better than you do, but is probably just much better at magic than you are. Yeah. Just just watch and think, okay, so I would lean towards this play, and then if they make it, you can pat yourself on the back a little bit, and if they don't, you can think, okay, so what am I missing? Yeah, and when it's way off, when you're like, okay, I think that they need to try to like sack this archive into draw cards and or whatever and then they're like attack with these things and you're like what you're so far behind but then like you see over the course of like five turns that like that extra damage really mattered they're almost always right i mean there's a reason that these guys are in like feature matches on the pro tour yeah it's not because they're less intelligent than you are right i mean it's because they're luckier we already know that but obviously they're way better at drawing collected (laughs) company it's just not fair how can you have it both ways (laughs) i'm i'm joking (laughs) um I I think that I think that if there's one thing that I would take away from what you guys just said, it's it's kind of that same premise, right? It, you need to watch to learn. You need to, you need to watch to question, not watch to correct. Yeah, and you need to be honest with yourself when you're doing it. If you see a great play, or somebody tells you about a play or a concept, and then you say, "Yeah, that's what I would have done," would you? Don't. Would you? Would you have? Would you have done? Would you? Is that when you would have? you know, activated your underworld, underworld connections. connections. No, I, cause I, I wouldn't have, I would have never occurred to do that. I think often though, the, the thing that's funniest about watching great players play magic is it's not mostly about making these crazy next level plays. It's mostly about just like getting the mundane stuff right over and over and over and over again and sort of slowly maneuvering the game to where they want it to be. Because when you play against players who make mistakes or when you make mistakes yourself, they're almost always silly mistakes. Most yeah. of the mistakes you make aren't missing these absurd lines. They're like attacking I, with the, the wrong thing. creatures because you did he, combat math wrong or tapping the wrong lands or representing, changing what you're representing to give your opponent more information. I think this silly is twofold things. because I think that, one, I actually don't think the lines are silly. I think that they're blatantly obvious once you realize what they are. Yeah, that's what he's saying. It's not like some insane thing that like you right it's not usually something that you just weren't even on that wavelength it's it's usually just, when you, you make mistakes they're it's just death dumb. by a, a thousand paper cuts is what he's saying you're making right. a bunch of small errors right and it's not that any one mistake costs you the but, game it's that you're losing a half a percentage point here a half right. a percentage point there and when you add together you know your slightly worse mulligan decisions your slightly worse land sequencing your slightly worse valuation of spells maybe you get the wrong thing countered or kill the right. wrong creature with and over time these add up and right, and the thing, the the second fold that I wanted, it, it kind of all in the, I guess it all in the episode of one thing, but like, if you haven't played Legacy, you should go play a brainstorm deck. And when you do it, you should have somebody who plays brainstorm decks watch you play. Yeah, and make sure that they have like a barf bucket because it's hard to watch somebody play brainstorm for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> but if you remember, like episode two that that Manny was on, he talked about, I can't play Legacy. This is too hard. And it, it's, I as somebody who played with Jace the Mind Sculptor, and never realized that I could put two Squadron Hawks back, play a Squadron <laughs> Hawk, and draw those two Squadron Hawks. I feel so stupid. I won so many matches. I was the number one ranked player, the number two ranked player in Utah, and never realized that was a thing that I could do. Yeah, that that was like the best part of Squadron Hawk. I mean, exactly. Uh, it never occurred to me that I could do something like that, and it's. Why? Why? Why do? Why does? And when you look back on it, you're like, "Wow, I'm dumb." <laughs> it's easy and to feel that way, right? I, it is, and and that's exactly. I think what you're talking about these minute things, these things that look. Well, I should have known that. Well, and sometimes you watch someone play a really masterful game, 
and the end result is really beautiful. Like I mean, I saw this a lot with various Westvale Abbey decks this weekend where they just slowly sort of lowered the clamps on their opponents from both sides to a point where there was just no way out. And if they'd been too quick to try to flip the Abbey, they would have probably just lost. But instead, you know, they they were just really patient. They really valued their cards correctly. They valued each creature correctly. They just did a really good job of kind of evaluating what resources were going to win them the game. Um, but But it wasn't one great play. It was just over the course of the game, making the slightly better play over and over and over again to where eventually it led to kind of an insurmountable advantage. Yeah. Well, I mean, what is, what is the John Finkel quote? Something like making the 51% decision the 11th time after it coming up 49, 10 times in a row, like just always making the right play, never giving up that percentage point ever. Right. No, the idea that there, there is only one right play is, Something that this podcast was built upon. So uh, I think that if you're watching the Pro Tour next time, kind of remember who you're watching. Remember why you're watching it because you're not there and they are. You don't even have to watch the next one. You can just go on Twitch and rewatch parts of this one. I mean, that's what I spent the last couple of days doing in my free time. Just YouTube also has that. You can watch trying to soak up as much information as possible because, you know, when when you play locally, not that players aren't good, but. You know, John Finkel is a high standard. Right. He's not playing your FNM. Right. Basically ever. Josh Erdelaine played our FNM. That's true. And didn't he like two, three drop? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, daggers. Um, so when I watch the PT, I'm learn- I love learning about formats in that context. The PT, the starting point is how much aggro to expect, and then you build from there. And that's an interesting starting point. Um, it should be the starting point that everybody takes everywhere, but they don't. I'm not sure why, but yeah. at the Pro Tour, it's how much aggro do I expect? What can I afford to build with? Right. Um, What's in my range? Right. And at SCGs and other and FNMs, people seem to forget that. And they're like, I'm going to build this sweet deck. I wouldn't even mm. say people forget that. I would say they never consider that. I mean, I think at lower levels, people just do what they want. And there's nothing wrong. Like, if you just want to play your FNM to play whatever deck you think is cool... That's a perfectly legitimate reason to play an F and M. Oh, and we agree with that. I think that, I think that, the, I think that the people who listen and have listened for a while, I think that they have goals in mind in Magic, and whatever those goals are, they're fine. Sure, I just mean I, I don't want to make fun of people who just play F and M. There's nothing wrong with just wanting to have fun. Was that? Did you feel like I was making fun of people who play F and M? No, I just wanted to to separate those oh, because okay. I, I'm just trying to like make sure that it's clear that those right. are sort of two separate categories. And if sure. your goal yeah. is really to win every event you play, you sort or of even have to, to do well your, at, you, even right. to, sure. to have a winning record at there's, there's things that you have to take into, you have to, the, the event starts before you draw your, first exactly, hand. exactly. Part of playing your best in an event is putting yourself in the best position possible by making deck building choices that right. give you a chance. And that's, that's the thing that I find interesting is like, what sacrifices did they make for aggro? What sacrifices did they not make for aggro? Like, what caused the deck building decisions to happen is what I love to see at the Pro Tour. And, and and that's always interesting to me. So, what do you think the next best, the deck will be that's the best next week? Michael, you won states with it, so you put down Green Black Aristocrats? It just feels wrong to to do as well as I did with the deck and not say that it's going to be great. I mean, I... It's hard to say coming off the Pro oh, Tour do weekend. Do you not regret audibling off of Mono White Humans? I mean, Mono White Humans is a good deck too, but I, I wanted to play the deck that I thought was sweeter. Um, and it ended up being a good choice. It worked out for me. Cool. K- Casey, what do you think the best deck will be? Um, I think it's hard to say anything other than green white tokens because it did have the highest win percentage. It did take down the tournament. It seems to have good matchups against most of the best decks. That, like, you know, just attacks from different angles that are hard to beat. I mean, that's kind of where you're trying to get with tokens decks in general. I think this one has the right tools to be it, it ends up a real being problem. Sort of similar to the Aristocrats decks in the way a lot of the games actually play out, not in terms of specific cards, but just right. the same way you're able to sort of go wide and then apply pressure from a variety of angles. Uh, it's really good at forcing opponents into positions where. Almost no matter what they do, they're going to get blown out by something, right? It's either like yeah. Dramoka's Command or Avacyn or uh, just Gideon Emblem minus Nissa. It's it's always something. Yeah. 
Exactly. I mean, we've seen that kind of thing before. Secure the wastes, untap, Gideon, emblem, kill you. Yep. Oh, okay. Good good games. <laughs> like <laughs> and it's it's like playing against Splinter Twin, right? Like the Tarmogoyf Twin decks where it's like I can either take four a turn for five turns and die, or I can kill this Tarmogoyf and die. Those are my those are my options. And it, watching the top eight especially, it felt like that a lot. Like Ruben was just able to get the games to a place where he got to do what he wanted to do. And his opponents could deal with part of what he wanted to do, but not the second part, and then they would just die. Right. There's just no like reasonable out to these types of decks sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think Secure the Waste has been underrepresented for a long time, so I'm glad to see it do something. Yeah, I think I was just talking about that the last time I was on the show, two weeks ago or whatever, that, like, that card has actually just never done anything, even though it's basically great. Yeah, I think you did. <laughs> Um, so the deck that I put down was actually Green Black Seasons Past. I think this deck will draw the best players and could create the best results because of it. Yeah, it uh, it is sweet. I don't. The problem is like it's not only sweet, but it it plays to the advantage that great players like to play with. Yeah. My only concern about this deck is how great do you have to be to make this deck good? Because like some pretty good some pretty good players that we know played it at states right and got laughed out of the room crushed. I mean, one one good I mean, player that I know played it at states. I yeah, thought I, that a few people. I wouldn't exactly it. say crushed. I mean, it, lost a one in for top eight. Oh, yeah, okay. it's the hard I mean, uh, I, I heard the story secondhand, so I, I already got crushed. But so it's it a high him? standard. No, oh, I was going to say he that, would tell that, that, that he that would is tell how that. Alex would present that. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got yeah. crushed. I I didn't win. Yeah, I got I, I didn't win the whole event. I got crushed. Did you hear from Matt? Yeah. I'm sure that's how Alex told it to him. Yeah, for sure. Uh, he, Alex got extremely unlucky against Gray for his first loss and then lost a win and in. I see. My bigger concern with that, that deck can is happen. the mirror match just seems unbelievably miserable. Or, I'm really, what? <laughs> I, say, I say that as someone who... I hope you go out and hear Casey excited about that. I, I say that as someone who thoroughly enjoys the Bant Company mirror match for what it's worth. Yeah. So there are people maybe, I'm know. Just, maybe I'm just weird, but that mirror match looks almost uniquely miserable. And there's some people that really like creature mirrors and some people that really like control mirrors. I really like control mirrors. And like the Bant Company mirror, I would rather actually not play Magic than... I would rather file my taxes. <laughs> I would rather um, stub my toe. Luckily uh, for you, it's April. Yeah, that's true. I think taxes were due already. That's true. I think you he might could be have gotten trouble. an extension. He can get an extension. He could be on starting early for next year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that seems impossible. <laughs> I mean, I mean uh, I've made some money. I can. Uh, but yeah, I I think that I would pick that deck just because of how it incorporates itself into the expected meta game and with the players that want to play that kind of deck. Yeah, I mean, with that being said, it's. Oh, no, sorry. I mean, I, I do agree with the assessment because Seasons Past is so powerful that, like, as long as you can find cards that cost different amounts of mana that still form a cohesive control strategy, I think that, like, it could be viable. I'm pretty and, interested to see different sorts of different sorts of exact deck lists that that shell shows up yeah. in. Just with, just, I mean, obviously, like, Reed Duke and uh, those guys, the Pantheon, they're Great, great builders and players, but sometimes I think having that things out thought. in the having things out in public a little bit, you just get more ideas and sort of collective, just just collective deck building can provide innovations that just limited eyes can't. That was my exact thoughts. Was that I'm excited to see where this deck goes. Yeah, I was actually kind of surprised that it didn't play blue, like didn't play Jace or that anything. Deck felt like it really wanted Jace. I also felt a couple of times like it might really want. Like this is kind of embarrassing, but like a rise from the tides, just so you nope. could just nope. so you could actually kill someone quickly. Yeah, it is kind of nice in a control deck to have like, a, okay, you're dead. We're we're done with this. I mean, that being said, I I don't actually suggest playing Rise from the Tides. I just wish that you it did. had a faster you just suggested way. To, it. You implied it. Um. All right. With that being said, with the, we'll end that on the Rise of the Tides <laughs> comment. Uh, card of the week. So we used to give this out earlier, but we want to give Patreon. Tim C, the card of the week. We're going to actually give him seasons past. Times two of them. That's all that was played in the uh, that deck. That's all you need. That's that's all you need, man. Uh, just shoot us a message either on the Patreon, either on Patreon.com or shoot me a message, Spencer Howland. Uh, we're happy to ship you those out, man. Uh, you can become eligible for this reward by becoming a Patreon of $3 or more per month. And we'll, uh, we'll, hook, a, we'll hook a guy are, up. Are you going to require a pledge to not play Rise from the Tides as well? 
No, he can if he wants. He can Tim can do whatever he wants with these seasons past. Yeah, he can get back like, uh, Suntail Hawk, Athalia, a Mirren Crusader, and I think they have to be spells, right? No, oh, is that or a non creature? Con- is it non creature? I don't. It, oh, is surpri- it any card? I'd be surprised if a green card advantage spell was non creature. Just cards. That's great. Yeah. Go you. You can get Go back you, a Tim. Squadron Hawk to set up your yeah and uh, Hero of Bladehold. I mean that's. It's a combo deck. You actually cannot play Blade, Hero Blade Hulk with your season's past. I forbid it. <laughs> um, yeah. I, overall, I think that what we learned from this Pro Tour is is that it's sweet. Magic is sweet again, guys. Uh, I was worried at the first week. I know Michael said he was worried two, you know, five days ago. It's it's sweet, guys. And uh, you know, when you're watching an event like this, when you're watching great players, watch them to learn. Like. There's so much you can do to improve all the time, and you're not going to do it if you're not in the mindset to do it. So, uh, clan, don't forget each other, clan on MTGO at, uh, you know, just by message me at Spencer thirteen dev. Uh, you can also message Quentin at uh, Earthstripe. That's U R T H S T R Y P E. That guy. It's apparently it's a name from a character in a book. Um, don't forget to share the pon- the the sponsor the sponsor at Oasis Games. <laughs> Uh, that's mtgoasis.com and oasisccg.com uh, don't forget that you can support the podcast directly by going to patreon.com slash ccmtg uh, Casey where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Facebook at Casey Tuna Bloodworth or on Twitter at CC Bloodthirst. Michael where can people find you? You can find me on Facebook in the Facebook group at uh, Michael Hinderocker that's H-I-N-D-E-R oh, they can't add you as a friend? I, you can I mean <laughs> You are welcome to add me as a friend. I he certainly just need more it. friends in the world. Um, or on Twitter at mhindy. That's m h one n d y. You can find me on Facebook at Spencer Stephen Howland. You can also find me in the Facebook group. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Spencer thirteen h. And you can find the show every week on constructedcriticism dot com, m- mtgcast dot com. I was about to say mtgoasis dot com. Uh, and um, you know, at various podcasting apps. If the, if you listen to this podcast in an inconvenient way, tell us how it would be easier for you, and we'll try and make it happen for you. Uh, don't forget to join the Constructor Criticism Facebook group. We actually got a question: Is that only for Patreons this week? It is definitely not. Everyone who is a listener of the show can join the Facebook group. Just search Constructor Criticism Facebook group on Facebook, and we'd be happy to add you. Uh, it's it's amazing. I love it. Uh, hashtag would that be good hashtag would that be good is our twitter outreach program every week on the show we read all of the tweets from last week for hashtag would that be good and talk about them on the show um where did we what day is it it's the 25th so we go back to um it'd be like the 17th right because we usually we record on sundays but today's monday okay so just kidding commune with lava as a one of in standard you are goggles hashtag would that be good no don't play Commune with Lava. Don't do it. It's tempting. I understand. You see it. You read the card. It looks like it does something, but it, it doesn't. Don't play it. Don't do it. It's a trap. It's a tarp. It's, it's a tarp. It's a tarp. It, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure you just don't want to play Commune with Lava. But I appreciate you for having ideas. Yeah. Keep thinking. Wait, so... I don't understand. What's the point with goggles? Because you can only still play one of those lands, right? You get twice as many cards. But yeah, I mean, it. I but does that help? I mean, it would you rather draw more good cards than or less cards? All the titans. Yeah, I think that you could just be doing more with the mana. Is really the issue. I think that, and also you ha- there. There is a deck building cost. It's one sixtieth of your deck, right? It's a one of at least one of, and it is just. I don't know. It's kind of sketchy. Yeah. I mean, I is, assume the idea is that you're probably playing on your opponent's end step, well, right? And yeah, getting like just a million is, cards. Yeah, the question is how much mana do you have with goggles well, in, in this deck? Well, let's say you well, So maybe in like the green red deck you might be able three. to do it. But even that deck plays like such expensive spells and like you're yeah. met using so much of your mana. It, yeah, the, I would rather just play another Ulamog. It ends that's up being the problem like is, is with goggles, or with not with goggles, with commune is that like the... The, I feel like when you get to that much mana, you just have big, huge yeah. things, so you just don't get to draw enough cards. Well, or it's going to be a really expensive, like anticipate, right? Right. Like look at the top seven cards, play one of them for nine mana, just sort of underwhelming. 
A little bit. A little but bit. you're probably going to want to play the most expensive one, right? I mean, if you like flip a Dragon Lord of Tarka and it's going to be reasonable, you're probably casting it. Went 4-0 with my dumb Teamer Walkers deck in the GPT yesterday. Has to be then drew in top eight. Obviously, if you're playing Teamer, it's good. That's the end of the story. But it gets better. We'll get back to you later, Michael. Uh, is it ethical to tilt my opponent before match by saying, Suh, dude? And if I know, is it logical not to? What? Um... So I, I saw this on Twitter, and so I think that, in general, trying to win by doing something other than playing magic is unethical. So, so have you heard the the best story that that um, Tom Martell has ever told? No. It's probably, I don't know the name of this pro player, but uh, he was friends with with uh, Mike Long, and but his game was mind games. So he's in a feature match of a pro tour, like Aaron Maranaka. Yeah, like, or even like higher level than that like higher level than that so they're in the feature match of the pro tour and they're rolling dice to see who goes first right and he throws the dice as high as he can in the air <laughs> 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 and then he goes one second he runs and goes and gets them comes back to the table and goes I rolled an eight and hands him the dice <laughs> what <laughs> Go ahead and roll. <laughs> what would you do? I would tell him he has to re-roll. Judge! <laughs> yeah. But, but how would you feel for the rest of the match? Like this dude was a I would jackass. be pissed if I lost. I would be pissed. You could not play magic for the rest of the day. No, but he might not be able to either after I kicked him so hard under the table. <laughs> um... So yeah, I don't know if that stuff is appropriate, but man, are the stories great? I think I it. it the, I don't know that sub dude. To be fair, it's like if hold you on, specifically. I think in this out. example, he specifically knows the person and knows that it will upset them. So I, I Casey, I play is mat. this actually any different from me handing you mono white with a game day play mat and penny sleeves? I think so because that was us trying to make our friends laugh, not trying to like specifically tilt the people I was playing against, right? But do you think they were tilted when they lost? I mean, maybe, but that was after I'd already beaten them, right? I wasn't doing, I wasn't playing that deck with the hopes that it would tilt them so that I could beat them. Okay. See, I think we should all buy play mats and then play with them upside down, like flipped over so you're playing on the black <laughs> rubber side and then just act really confused. I think that, I would find that tilting personally. <laughs> now, the most tilting thing I've ever seen oh my as far gosh. as that goes. So, Michael and I are in the, are playing well, and he was goes. was a McDonald's fast food tray. He was using that as a play mat. No, he wasn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> So, <laughs> what? Yeah. Michael and I are playing, and he turns, he, uh, somebody talks about the playmat is sweet, and Michael says, Michael says, you get a top eight for top, you get a playmat for top eighting states? I need a new playmat, I lost mine. <laughs> Alex looks over to me and goes, that's what you care about? That's, <laughs> that's your goal here. <laughs> well, no, my goes, real goal was to get the he middle. Goes, he goes, well, I'm not going to buy a new playmat, I need to win one. Yeah, I agree. I've never bought a playmat. I would you? It would be insane. Well, uh, I bought a playmat right when I started playing, and it was it was just plain white. I'm very distressed that I've lost it because I really enjoyed the questions I would get about it. Are you going to draw in that? Why does it look dirty? Why is it? <laughs> I don't know because I just bought a white playmat. And Red white tokens with Gideon it. Nahiri, Hangerback Walker, Pink Karen, Declaration, Dragon Fodder, Oath of Gideon, Westfell Secure. Hashtag that would be good. Um, Cody, uh, so I've talked to Cody about this a little bit. I, I think that, like, I do think that there is room in the format for tokens decks. And I think that what Green White did shows that. And I think that there is room to explore. I don't like Dragon Fodder. I understand that Cody says it's been really good for him. So I could be wrong. Yeah. Maybe the answer is Naya, right? Maybe the answer lies somewhere between. Um, who knows? I'm a little ambivalent about Naya, just given that you're probably trying to play Nissa, Pia, and Kieran, and Gideon in the same deck. But, I mean, I, I think sort of there's already proof of concept, so right. you might be making it worse in some ways, but maybe it works better for you, or but, maybe you like it better. Or... Exactly. But I think if you're going who to knows? test an idea like this, you have to be honest with yourself, though, is what's important. Am I playing this sure. because it's different or because it's better? Sure. Thank goodness for Twitter, Workshop Killing me slowly, PTSOI keeping me alive. Hashtag Twitter life support. Hashtag would that be good? Man, that PT was great, man. I don't know what to tell you. It was the greatest. 
No. So was it Mishra's workshop or was it like a workshop? I think it was a workshop. It's like he was a workshop, in. workshop. Yeah. Although those are the worst. Mishra's workshop could definitely. Oh yeah, it's yeah. the slowest kill. Yeah. Not really. It's turn one, play something. You don't get to play magic anymore. <laughs> right, and then you just sit there and die for an hour. Hey, you're already dead. You're mostly just a corpse at the table. One Alberta standard SCG provincials. Hashtag MTG. Hashtag SOI. Hashtag would that be good? Hashtag rug life. I just want to note that once again we're seeing a picture of someone with the medal around their neck, but and it I'm might be pretty, the only picture. I was going to say I'm pretty sure they were forced to take this picture. Move over, Spencer thirteen H. There's a new state champion on the podcast, and his name is M Hindi. Congratulations, man! Thanks, I really appreciate it. I honestly, I was really surprised to win. I. That sounds kind of Shut weird. I, I was like, I didn't think the deck was that good. Like, I barely audibled onto it. That Casey, morning. I appreciate your high rolls. And Casey was like, we were both sort of like, I actually don't know that this is better than mono white, but I'm, yeah, I told I'm you doing take, it anyways. Take both, look at the room, and make a I, yeah. I didn't follow your gut. That. I just brought green black. I titled it bad, and then it was really good. So it, it was the old it was reverse a, psychology yeah, trick. Yeah, it was great. Well, let's move on to Eggbeat, who says. Being able to order a beer at McDonald's. Hashtag would be good. Hashtag PTSOI. So dude was in That's Spain. That's why I scrubbed Hold out. Hold on. Egg B Dang was... It. Oh, he was at the Pro Tour. Yeah. Quinn was running up the score bragging about that too when he got back from Belgium too. Um, I don't even know what... I, uh, they had a great cider in... in uh, they had really great cider in... Uh, Hashtag would that be good for my liver? No. Hashtag, would that be good for my wallet? What no. kind of beer could you possibly Hashtag, be ordering Hashtag, you're already McDonald's. at McDonald's, so what about that? <laughs> That's what I was just thinking. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening this week. Uh, I hope that you all enjoyed the Pro Tour in this sweet format, and I hope that you all love magic as much as I do, because it's great. So, see you guys all next week. See you around. <laughs> see you even later than Casey. Magic, magic, magic.